Hello and welcome to today's podcast with Bell Geospace. I am your host, Michelle Dawn Mooney, and I'm excited about the topic we have today. We're talking about the point of view of a young woman in mining in Africa paired with advice and perspective from a successful and experienced woman in mining. And I have two great guests to talk about this topic. I would like to introduce you to Rhea Tinian. She is the data management and geophysical consultant for Bell Geospace and Connie Sigalki. MSC University of Cape Town. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. So I really am excited to hear about this because not only are we talking about business here, because obviously we want to talk about some very important things with Bell Geospace and mining, but this really is about stories and personal stories and humanity and some interesting kind of takeaways and background with two people who are involved in this industry. And I think people are really going to enjoy it. So before we kind of jump into everything, Connie and Rhea, let's start off with a little background. So can you tell me a little bit about yourselves, of course, and then share with us how you came to know each other. I'll start, I'll give you a little bit of background just on my career. I'm an exploration geophysicist by profession, and I started my career at the Geological Survey of South Africa, and then I moved on to a geophysical contracting firm, spending most of my early days as a field geophysicist, managing field crews, uh, being away from home a lot. Um, and then until my da daughter was born, my uh, my work changed a little bit. I was more office bound. And then I started to work for a um, an international software company. And I've been doing a bit of a leadership role there uh, over the last 20 years. And then things changed during COVID and I became an independent consultant. And that's really how I ended up with Bell Geospace, doing some contract work for them. And they invited me to attend the mining in Daba. They had a free ticket and asked me for suggestions on who we can actually um, sponsor to use that ticket. Uh, I looked at the Mining and Dabo website and I saw they had a youth program and um, I didn't know who who to actually reach out to. I started off with my contacts at Wits University and then UCT. I ended up searching on LinkedIn and I found Connie <laughs> on LinkedIn. It was actually so, one of her followers posted this lady just graduated, um, she needs a job. And I thought, okay, let me reach out to Connie and see if she is available and if she was interested in in taking up that ticket and spending five days at the mining in Darba. Yes, I'm 28 years old. I've just recently graduated from UCT, a master's in geology. And yeah, I did my undergrad in Limpopo, one of the provinces in South Africa. Yeah, and it was quite great. I did I did it in mining and geology. And then I tried to look for a job for, for some time. Then nothing was coming up. So I decided to further my studies. And yeah, went down to Cape Town to start my, my master's. Yeah, nothing much. <laughs> Yeah, and nothing Ria. Much. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as Ria's career uh, journey goes. Yeah, so Ria, I was very surprised to see her message on LinkedIn because I was so frustrated that I really want to go to the Indaba, but I don't have a ticket and I don't have anyone to sponsor me. And I did sign up for the for the Young Leaders Program, but no one was actually contacting me. So I was kind of like stressing and panicking, like, okay, the days are drawing near and nothing's happening. And then to my surprise, I see Ria's um, message on LinkedIn. I did not know how she found me. I really didn't know how she found, she found me, but I was so excited that she did. And yeah, we just kicked it off right there. And Everything was organized for me to fly down to Cape Town to attend the Indaba. And that was really amazing. That's wonderful. So 
I know it's no big thing to get your master's and have this spectacular education if you ask you, but that is such a huge feat. So Connie, tell me, you have this unbelievable education under your belt, and now it's time to go out and put it into practice. So talk about being in the real world and that job search. What has that been like? Well, um, that has been really crazy. <laughs> it's been such a roller coaster. Um, I I started looking for a job immediately after finishing my undergrad, and ooh, nothing was really coming up. I started like in my final year. I started looking for a job, applying, and doing all of these things that we do, looking for jobs, and um, nothing was coming up. And in 2018. I was like, um, okay, <laughs> I'm here and time is moving. I need to do something. So I decided that, okay, let me just do a master's and see what happens after that. Because I can't, I'm not a person that would sit down and wait and not do anything. So I decided that, okay, I'm going to start my master's. And I didn't have like any other options. So I started my master's in my previous university. So I did it for like a year. And and then um, mid-year of 2018, I got an opportunity to attend um, the, the GEO Congress, which was in Johannesburg. So when I got there, I met, um, I met my supervisor, my master's supervisor. He, we spoke during the social sessions and uh, he was like, OK, I have this project in northern Chile. I don't know if you'd be interested, but... If you would be interested, I can tell you much about it. So we, we had a discussion and I was really interested in the project. So then I was like, okay, I think I'd like to, to to take up the opportunity. And then, so mind you, I've already started another master's. But then because like I'm, I'm always this person who would actually push and start over to actually do exactly what I want to do. So I actually dropped out of that master's in 2018. 2019, I did like one year of that master's. And then in 2019, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to move to Cape Town. So I moved to Cape Town to start a new master's. And then it was so amazing. The experience was so great. And um, yeah, that was amazing. And um, I never stopped applying for jobs though, even though I was doing my master's, because I believe that I could actually handle both. If I were to get a job, I would actually still meet my deadlines for my master's and and submit my thesis in time. So that was not a problem for me. But <laughs> I was never lucky. <laughs> From 2018 till till this year, I was never lucky. Any job, like, I don't know how many jobs I applied for. I, I can't even count because if I start counting, I'd probably go to a 1,000 <laughs> It is so crazy. I and yeah, and it was so painful because I mean I'm like growing up and my time for for attend uh, for for like being a, a candidate in an internship was like running out. You can't be thirty and still looking for an internship. I'm twenty eight this year. I it was so crazy. I was just like so stressed about that because you can't just start on a big road. You have to start from internships, graduate programs, and then you, you level up. So for me, it was like, this is my age for getting internships, but I'm not getting any internship. So that was very stressful for me. And yeah, I, but I never stopped applying. I kept on applying any opportunity that comes, I apply. And ah, well, it, it never worked out. Finished my master's at UCT and came back home last year around March. And yeah, that was a lot coming back home, facing reality. That was so bad. And yeah, I got depressed somewhere along the way. And I kept on doubting, like, I mean, am I even different from those people that I see, like people that I grew up with who did not take education seriously? It's like now we are like one and the same person. There's no difference between the two of us. So I'm like, this is, this is just so bad. So I did get depressed at some point and but I never stopped applying. I would take a break from applying for jobs just to <laughs> just to gather my strength and then go back and, and, and apply again. Yeah, so it was a very difficult journey until 
now that I got my master's, I got like two interviews and um, I only attended two interviews in my entire life, two job interviews. The first one was lecturing. I didn't get that one. And the last one that I attended last month, I got the job. So <laughs> now I'm <Yay>! unemployed. <laughs> And what's exciting about this job is that it's not an internship and it's not an entry level job. I'm like somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in like the second stage of employment. And it's really great because I'm going to get like lots of benefits and I'm going to be in a role where I'll be leading a team and actually making decisions for the company. So I was so happy. Because I've always been stressed about, okay, I'm 28, I can't be in an internship. So now it's like, this is such a blessing. Yeah. That's unbelievable. And persistence pays off. I, I just applaud you for your mindset, even when you talked about you know, having those times where you were getting depressed. Um, it has to be so defeating because, you know, and, and Rhea, I am going to pull you into this because, you know, Connie did everything right. Um, and she is the rarity, really kind of a gem, not not with a pun intended for mining here, but you really, you know, stood out above so many others who really didn't care about their education. You're doing everything you can in your power, and yet it's still so hard. And, and thankfully, we have a happy ending now. So, Ria, let me ask you this. Are there any services or support options for people like Connie who are, are doing everything right? They're they're doing whatever they can to their ability, but it's still just not coming to fruition. You know, it's an industry that actually has the ability to create so many jobs, you know, um, but it just doesn't. Okay, we do have a, a general problem with um, unemployment in South Africa, you know, with the huge socioeconomic um, issues. But uh, you, you look at, we're in an industry where... Um, you know, if, if it's managed properly, it, it could. So if we get the if we get the mining cadaster right, if we get all the right policies in place and and we become that a, attractive uh, country again, those job opportunities are there. And there's also, you know, with because we're in the sort of it's, it's kind of industrial revolution in technology. It doesn't mean women in mining, oh, you need somebody to go that has to go underground. That's not what it's about. You know, there are they they could be you could be trained as a drone pilot to do monitoring of the mine. Um, there's so many new technologies available uh, to enhance that whole mining operation and in the value chain. So there, there should be doors that, that can open, but we need, if we can't get mining companies and exploration companies in coming, even coming here because they can't apply for a license, then how are we going to unlock those opportunities for these young people? In my experience, uh, and, and Connie and I actually did chat about that during the mining in Darba, um, as she mentioned, there's that the NRF internship program, but th those are really for, um, and not, not for someone with, ca uh, with Connie's caliber, you know. Um, what we also experienced at the Mining in Darba was the women in mining, um, and I have been a member and following women in mining um, over the years. And what I think is really wonderful about these, it's not just in South Africa, there's different women in mining, international women in mining, and they do offer um, opportunities for mentorship, for thought leadership. Um, it's a great uh, place to also do networking. Um, and they really advocate for women in, in the mining industry. You know, there are some really strong role models in the industry and um, women in mining bring together, uh, you know, those, those great, uh, great women that has um, a sort of passed away for others to, to follow. Um, but there are also, you know, these global economic changes that uh, that adds to the challenges that that Connie's faced. Yes, obviously, women in mining, that gender inequality is is a reality for us here in South Africa, um, and and globally, I, I think is a handful of countries that actually look 
at women and look at their professional capabilities um, in the industry and and don't close the door just just based on on gender um, I also you know looking at um, at the time depending on where we are in that global economic um, with are we in a downturn are we in an upswing there's volatility and depending on where where we are in that a wave uh, some some people some students don't want to choose that as as a job you know they'll say okay there's no job opportunities because the mining cycles down if it's on a climb and you start depending on where you are you might decide that i really want to there's a lot of job opportunities in this industry then you start your career and then it crashes and then you sit without work so these all these um macro things at play in in the background that that could be against um, young people looking for opportunities um, and particularly also in South Africa you know we don't have um, at the moment we don't have a a modern online system for attracting investment um, and if we can't attract investment we don't get international explorers and miners coming into the country and those are the, the key uh, providers of of jobs for for young people. Yeah, I want to zero in more on that, what you said with South Africa. Uh, first of all, what makes South Africa the perfect backdrop for the Green Revolution? And with that said, what are some issues that you kind of touched on that come to light with attracting those investors? And then do you think that's a long-term issue or do you think that there's something we can do to solve that? Africa is like a treasure chest for for mineral exploration. Um, South Africa has a lot of the uh, critical minerals that we need for to move into the green energy. Um, we don't well. We have vast quantities of some of the minerals: um, gold, iron ore, and so forth. Lithium and cobalt, not so much. But there are obviously other African countries that, that do have them. So we have all the right minerals required. So the critical minerals, we say tick box there. Um, however, you can have the minerals, but if we are not high on the Fraser Institute list of attractiveness, explorers will go somewhere else. You know, they take their money and find another geological unit to explore and won't come to South Africa. Um, they South Africa's dropped, I think we're on the bottom 10 now of, of attractiveness on the Fraser Institute. And, and that is not a good position. It's declining. Um, and it's mainly because there's no transparency um, in the mining industry. Uh, we do have an internal mining cadastre. It's, it's aging. It's not transparent. It's not modern. It's not completely online. Um, there's a huge backlog even of current applications for prospecting licenses, mining licenses. It's just sitting there. It's not being moved through the system. So there are those barriers to entry for these um, exploration companies that has an impact on the attractiveness. So Rhea, as a follow-up to that, what can you tell me about the role that exploration companies like Bell Geospace play in all of this? Well, geophysics is known to support um, mapping of a specific geological units that would host the, the target, the ore body. Um, and with the advancements in geophysics, uh, technologies like full tensor gravity radiometry is what Bell Geospace offer. Those uh, technologies are extremely useful when we are trying to unravel very complex geology that hold, host these um, critical minerals. Um, and also... Everything that's on surface has probably been discovered already. So there's a tendency to look deeper. Um, so they're starting to look at these deep mineral systems and really get to understand the origin of um, of these ore deposits. And to, to use geophysics in supporting that geological interpretation, you need to combine, you know, the latest technology, integrating various methods, and that's really where Bell Geospace can uh, 
you know, is playing an important role. So let's zone in more specifically with big kind of topic at hand and an underlying topic of the main topic here, women in mining. And, you know, not only are we presenting Connie's story and Rhea's story, because you have the person who's just starting out, you have somebody with more experience, but specifically being a woman in mining, Connie, you briefly shared with us some of the the pitfalls, I guess, that you could say that you had, and uh, thankfully some good news there at the end. But tell us a little bit more about your personal experience now, especially working in the industry. I've been in academia for quite some time, and the industry has just been slipping off my hands. Every time I tried to reach it out, it's just been slipping off my hands. But I did get an opportunity when I was in third year to do my um my industrial attachment because then you wouldn't graduate without it. So I did get like the feel of being in the industry for like six months. I was in one of the mines here in South Africa in Johannesburg. And who I always felt small because um, the office that I was in, I was in a rock engineering office and everyone was male. I don't want to lie. I did not see any female in that office everyone was male like the person that was taking me underground was male I did not see any any women there so for me it was a bit puzzling like okay I'm here I'm the only girl here and I'm only doing training like why am I not seeing someone modeling what what I want to do or where I want to go why am I not seeing a woman a fellow woman doing great in this office Because then it looked like this was like a difficult thing to do now. Who do I think I am in this office, male only, and I'm here, like, is it ever going to work out for me in the industry? So that was quite scary for me. When I went to that mine, I was so scared because I did not see anyone like me. And that was really scary and it got me questioning myself am i in the right field am i doing the right thing am i ever gonna get an opportunity where i will be part of these people who are working here or i'm just gonna stay like this like i I just didn't understand so that actually taught me it gave me like sort of uh, a feel of how the industry is when they say it's male dominated so i got to experience streams of it where the only woman you would see is the woman who's going to come and pick up the trash, like in the office, who's going to take out the trash can. That's the only woman you're going to see. So it was so scary. Like, I don't want to lie. I was like, okay, so now what are they saying here? Are they saying that this is what we're good for, picking up the trash cans and cleaning the offices? Like, what are they saying? And does this mean the company is like a bit hypocritical? Because I'm here, but I don't see anyone else like me. Like, what are they doing? Are they just trying to show faces? What are they doing? So it was so scary. Up to now, that was like the worst experience ever. And then um, when I went to when I went to to, to UCT to do my my my, my masters um, in the department, uh, okay, well, gender wise, well, people were represented. And and um, and men, but um, personally, I feel like most of the important role roles were like assumed by our male counterparts. Uh, it is <clears throat> even when it comes to field work, like we would like go to do field work with the the undergrad students. So you would find that the people they are going to pick to go do field work would be uh, male because. Apparently, male can handle the harsh environment. (laughs) So that was crazy. Like, I'm like, I'm in this field. I chose this. What do you mean I can't stand the harsh environment? (laughs) So it was really crazy. With the interview process, because you talked about going in and, and seeing no one like you representing the female side of things. What was the interview process like? when you are applying for these jobs, when you've just stated there were basically only men that you're seeing everywhere? Okay, so that's an opportunity when 
still doing my my undergrad when I was in third year. So I did not have to interview for that opportunity. I just had to send a couple of emails and and a few motivational letters asking to do that practical training because I wasn't going to graduate my undergrad without that practical training. So I interview for that. But when I got to the place, when they accepted me to come in for the for the for the training, um, there was there, there were no women there, and I I didn't know about that because also even if I knew that yeah, there are no women in this department. <laughs> I would still do it because then it was the only opportunity that was presented to me and I needed to graduate. So I had to just be there and do what I have to do and show them that we can actually do more than picking the trash can. So yeah, it was like, after all, it was like a great experience. It was like a great experience. I had my best underground and I actually, my, my, my honest research was also based in that mine. So I did an investigation of the support system in that mine as I was in the rock engineering department. And my recommendations were actually used in the mine to actually continue with uh, mining and mining in a safety way and also ensuring that their safety or reinforcement systems are good. Were there any questions that you were asked that you felt were more specific to you being Connie and being a female, maybe more so than the average male who's going in to apply for the job? Okay, so yeah, like this uh, company that um, I'm going to start working for in September, it, in the interview, like the first interview, we had like two interviews. The first interview, the very first question was like, Courtney, are you married? And I just paused for a bit. <laughs> I didn't understand. Like, I thought they were going to ask me to, to tell about myself. Like, why are they asking me if I'm married or not? Because um, now it was like they were trying by all means to make sure that I don't leave that out because they want to know if I'm married or not. Because then if they say if they said, tell, tell us about yourself, maybe I would actually miss telling them that I'm married or maybe miss telling them about my relationship status. So they had to ask me that like as a first question and I was so perplexed, like how is that important here? Yeah. But then anyway, I answered the question and, and then we moved on. But really I, I was asking myself like, okay, is this not weird? <laughs> is this not weird? Cause like, I mean, how is me being married gonna affect me working in a mine. Like, right. Rhea, I, I want you to jump in on this because what advice, what advice can you give people like Connie and, and other women who may be thinking to possibly dive into the mining industry? What can you give them with regard to what we're hearing from Connie and questions that you know that the men are not getting? I, to be honest, I had a similar question to Connie, and, and I'm talking 30 years ago, so it's quite appalling that things haven't changed. You know, the inner, the gender inequality, racial inequality, um, it's it's still there, and honestly, it it does need to change. Uh, you know, one one example I could use is when when I was listening to one of the podcasts from the women in mining, they interviewed a male and they said to him, well, they asked him, what, what advice would you give? And what I found interesting, what he said, he said, if I had a daughter that was interested in this industry, I would tell her to use her voice, to be direct and to stand her ground. And he also mentioned, he called it the triple I. He says, this is triple I to success. Uh, just because you have knowledge, you have a degree, doesn't mean you have insight. So own that knowledge, create insight from that knowledge. And and he said, reach out to people. It is to the, the right people. You need to influence the right people. Um, and yes, use your voice to make an impact. Now, it's those are words and when you listen to it it sort of resonates you know there's a reality out there there's connie's reality and if i think back what i did was i worked so hard just to become a subject matter expert um 
what I also did was I I tried to understand where do I where does my job really fit into that whole mining and mineral value chain? Not just beyond go beyond your own job description. Not I'm a field geophysicist and I'm doing this particular job. I try to understand how did my job impact um, what uh, what were the out the ultimate outcomes. Um, you know, I really wanted to be part of that sort of decision making process. I didn't want to just go and survey where people told me to survey. I wanted to be the one looking at the maps, making the decision. Um, and I I had to sort of connect with people to try and understand that overall value chain um, and that that helped me to be honest that helped me a lot At, and also during my time we didn't have there was women in mining internationally we didn't have the South African body uh, or maybe not as as present as they are now so I would really recommend that um, people like Connie you know become a member you know reach out to to them there are some great women uh, thought leaders in in that group already uh, connie mentioned you know you you are you already a thought leader yourself in what you've implemented for health and safety and as you know it's critical in mind you know here in south africa we celebrate when we get a law passed just to design clothing that fits a woman you know, it's it's sort of those small steps where we need those bodies to advocate for us. And and the thing is, policies need to change and be implemented at government level. So as women, we have to stand together and our voice, you know, for, for others to hear, this is, this is what we want. And they also have to believe that we can make a difference. Let me ask both of you advice for women looking into pursuing a career, just starting out, what would you tell them? I would say go for it. Follow your dream. <laughs> it's 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 already difficult. And I feel like everyone's just like making it more difficult because they just say, it's just hard being a woman in the industry. I say, I would say to, to that person, go for it. As long as you have your goals set up, as long as you know what role you're going to play. Go for it and make sure that you play that role because no one else is going to play it for you. We need women who are going to go for it in order for this whole stereotype to just die off because this one day is going to be phased out like completely. There's like women coming in as CEOs of big companies that I see in South Africa and that's actually a motivating factor for for me and I feel like it's also a motivating factor for most people most women in this country who are looking into uh, pursuing a career in mining so I feel like we need to go for it never doubt we go for it the more women are going to be engaged in the industry the more this whole stereotype is gonna die we we all gonna be equal one day so we go for it, we play our roles we do our best and we make sure that we are not just part of the process we are the ones making that process. We are the ones determining what what must happen in this process. We, we make decisions in, in, in the industry so so that our voice can be heard and and we can be taken seriously and the whole thing just dies off, this whole stereotype of women, uh, whatever. We just like go for it. I would say go for it, honestly. And both of you pretty much said the same thing. <laughs> Rhea, it was right out of your mouth. Like, just just do it. Just go for it. And then Connie so eloquently uh, basically gave a, a little bit more meat to that. But I could hear the, the music swelling in the background and applause, applause, because that was so beautifully said. And as you said, if, if we don't do this, how do things change? So that first step, just go after your dream. Connie, if you have the chance, would you go again to Indaba? Yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> I would actually go to the Indaba again. It was, besides like all the other things that were happening or maybe the things that happened after or um, my expectations not met, like like what I wanted to achieve from the whole event, I feel like the dialogues that were, 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 were going on there were so important for me and 
for for me as a person who's trying to understand the industry I attended a lot of dialogues and it was amazing I needed to know all of that I needed all of that insight and the whole social experience was also great so I would go back to the endeavor and um and I, I really encourage um companies to do this for students because this was so amazing for me. I, I don't even know how to explain it, but it, for it happening to me, it was so amazing. I couldn't believe it was happening for me. So I I, I feel like uh, um, Belgio Space did a very great thing with the ticket. I feel I, I wish that they could continue having these extra tickets. I don't know how it happens. I don't know if it happens randomly, <laughs> but I feel like now they should plan. <laughs> I feel like now they should plan for it to happen, mm. that there's a ticket for a student. Because imagine if I didn't go there, I wouldn't have known all of this that, that is happening in, in the industry. I wouldn't have met the people that I've, uh, I've met there. And I feel like at some point, if not now, at some point, I was definitely going to get a job or get an opportunity through one of the people that, I'm, that I've met there. So even the company that I'm going to start working for now, I went to the to their booth like at the Indaba and I had a chat with some of the people and I, I, I actually identified it as a great company. And when I was interviewing for the job, I mentioned that, yes, I had a chat with people there and because they asked me, how do you how did you how did you like get to know about us? I was like, I didn't know much about you, but then. Going to visit your booth at the Indaba, I sat down with one of the people there and they, they told me about the company and I was so interested. The whole thing was just so interesting to me. So when I saw the job advertisement, I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply for this and because I would like to be part of this company continue doing it put it as like part of your initiative we we we, we want companies to do this we, we love seeing this happening ria how does that make you feel to hear her talk about indaba in in such a fantastic way i i agree you know what it's i've been going there for many years through my previous employment and yes there was the online indaba during COVID, but it was really good to have that face to face again you know you you get to meet all the decision makers um it's really difficult to build a business an online business uh you know there's all these gatekeepers you can't get to decision makers whereas at the mining in Darba, people are there to um network um so everybody's open to discussions you know you you could you have the opportunity to go to the exhibition you have you can l listen to talks like Connie's saying you could it's sort of a one place where you could meet um even different african governments finding out what people are doing so you know it's it's great that, that we were able to go there again and i really I agree with connie if if there are these spare tickets which you normally get when you're an exhibitor you know, give it, give it to the students. These, these guys need these opportunities to, to go and see what, what is out there. Um, you know, it increased their chances to, to find uh, job opportunities. So I, I would recommend what, what Connie's saying. Any final thoughts as we're wrapping up here? I think from my side, I, I'd like to say, um, you know, we need to inspire women to actively build a better world through mining. And some people would say, you know, mining is, dest is destructive. It, yes, it can be destructive, but if it's managed properly, we, you know, it's an ever-changing world. We're now focusing on critical minerals for renewable energies. We're becoming more environmental and socially aware. And I think women has such an important role to play in this industry in the future? For me, um, um, I am for what Ria is saying and I am for women standing up and doing great things. And yeah, like in South Africa and the whole world now we are looking into this just transition. I just wanna see women spearheading that. I wanna see, I wanna, I wanna hear it on the news or on LinkedIn that, okay, there's this woman out there who developed this whole thing or I don't know, a program or something 
something that is going to make things easier for the just energy transition to happen or the green energy to happen i want to see women doing big things there i want to see innovations that was spearheaded by women that's what i want to see and and i know it's possible so i i just want us to stand up and and just do what we can do to to move forward in the industry moving the industry further and of course today's topic talking about how we can take mining to the next level but more specifically where do women play a role in that and as we've heard from both of you uh some exciting things happening and connie once again i'm so i'm so proud of you just meeting you uh within this podcast but hearing your story and, and what you've been able to accomplish and ria what a voice you are for people like Connie and people who are just coming into the industry and and you're kind of the trailblazer there getting into this years ago as you said and some of the unfortunately similarities still exist but as you both said go for it and the more women who are taking that step the more that we can make it the norm that we see those men and the women working in those offices and I I just applaud both of you and I thank you so much for being with me today, Rhea Tinian, Data Management and Geophysical Consultant for Bell Geospace, and Connie Sagalki, MSC University of Cape Town, and starting a new job in September. And we're very excited for that. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Michelle, for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ria. You know what you did for me, you know. <laughs> so thank you all for listening. Of course, this is the Bell Geospace podcast. We've been talking about the point of view, young women in mining and hearing from a more experienced woman in mining, bridging those stories together, uh, the information that both of them can share and hopefully making a difference in the future. So we have more women in mining. Once again, I'm your host, Michelle Don Mooney. Thanks for joining us and we will see you soon.